If you ever find yourself being chased by a swarm of angry bees, you should never stop running to eat some honey. Everyone knows bees love honey. Whose turn is it to go get the wood? For the last couple weeks, we've been using a lot of hand tools on projects here in the Stumpy Dubs workshop, and that means a lot of sharpening. Last week, we showed you how we do it with our work sharp. If you haven't seen that, you really should go back and watch it at stumpydubs.com. This week, we're gonna show you how we make tool rests to do sharpening on our regular grinder and our wet grinder. We decided we wanted tool rests for several grinders, so we cut all the pieces at once because if you're going to make one, you may as well make three. The heart of an adjustable grinder is this little rocker wheel. Rough cut on the bandsaw and then sanded to the line. Of course, those wheels need to be supported by a couple of legs to pivot on. The angle is not so important. You just want to make sure they're tall enough to keep the rocker off the base. Positioning the hole is pretty important. It needs to be centered, but not so close to the top that it interferes with the grinding platform. Each tool rest will require two of these identical to each other. When you're cutting on the bandsaw, you often have little pieces of scrap that need to be flicked out of the way. It's easy to carelessly use your finger, and many injuries occur that way. So I keep a pencil handy and use it to clear the debris. Once both your legs are cut out, apply some double-sided tape and line the two up. If they're attached together, you can drill one hole through both pieces at the same time, and that way you're sure that it lines up perfectly. A lot of double-sided tape is kind of thick, and that makes things less stable when you're cutting or drilling two pieces together. We use thin double-sided tape, and we keep it in a Ziploc bag so the exposed part doesn't get covered with dust between use. The size of each component in this particular project doesn't really matter that much. It's going to depend on how big your grinder is, how high it is, things like that. But the way each component relates to each other is very important. For example, the rocker circle has to have the flat spot cut at just the right place that the platform that fastens to the top doesn't drag when you try to make your adjustments. Things like that require assembling things, then making your marks, then making your cuts to make sure everything works out just right. For this cut, double check that your saw blade is square to the table. When you cut these pieces, you don't want to feed them through your saw by hand. Drill a hole in the center and screw it to a piece of scrap. This way, you make an accurate cut only through wood and not through fingers. There are other grinding jigs out there that move back and forth as you grind across the wheel, but as you do that it removes material and so you have to either tilt the blade down, which messes up your angle to make more contact, or you have to advance the angle towards the wheel. I wanted a way to do that, but still keep things perfectly aligned. The answer is a strip of hardboard that attaches to the bottom of the upper platform. That rides in a dado that's on the lower platform, and then the two platforms can slide together. Using hardboard for the slider is important because it won't expand and bind with humidity. You want it to fit just perfectly, so get it close and then use some coarse sandpaper to fine tune it. To make a really accurate wooden grinding jig, it's going to be bulky and it's going to take some time, plus you're going to have to buy all the hardware. So at 25 bucks, buying the Veritas grinding jig was kind of a no-brainer for us instead of making one. The best part about this jig is it's self-aligning. 
Moving a couple of brass pins can accommodate different sized chisels and plane blades and still keep them perfectly squared to the stone. And by moving the lower pin to the center position, you can also do a 30 degree skew on chisels and plane irons. It's designed to slide back and forth across the wheel in a slot in their separately sold tool rest. That's a feature we're going to take advantage of in our tool rest. Not only does our tool rest design have more features, but it's a lot cheaper than the $60 Veritas wants for theirs. We start by cutting a rabbit and a dado in our upper tool rest platform. The position of these are critical in order for your rest to slide freely. So take your time and get it right. Remove just a little bit at a time until you have a perfect fit. If it's too tight, it's not going to slide freely. If it's too loose, it's going to wobble and not be accurate. Okay, that was the upper platform. The hardboard strip glues to the bottom of the upper platform and that rides in a dado on the lower platform. I really like this double platform idea. I think if they ask me nicely, Veritas just might be able to buy the idea from me. Well, maybe not, because I'm not the one who came up with the idea. Properly aligning the two platforms is another critical part of this design, and it starts with gluing that strip onto the upper platform. The best way to do it is to wax the lower platform pop a couple washers in the slot and then set your hardboard strips in glue side up. Now carefully position that upper platform so that it lines up perfectly square with the lower one. Clamp it down and wait for it to dry. Before you glue the legs to the tool rest base you want to assemble it. Put a washer on the outside of each leg, one on each side of that rocker disc and then a nut to hold it together. It's important to do this before you glue so that you can get those legs perfectly positioned. I also used a square in order to make sure that it was positioned properly on the base. Holding it down with something heavy like a hand plane is a great way to keep it steady while it dries. Last week we tried to answer some of your email, but we get so much of it that we think we need to make this a weekly thing. So we're going to just do one email per week, and I'll answer your questions. This week we get an email that says, Dear Stumpy, could you explain the numbering system for Stanley Planes? Well, of course I can. You see, Stanley Planes were originally numbered from 1 to 100. They picked these numbers based on how expensive the hand planes were when they first came out. The number one hand plane was $10. The number two hand plane, $20, and so on. It's also interesting that other hand plane companies, like Miller's Falls, used a similar numbering system, but based on the length of the plane. The number one plane was one inch long, all the way up to the number 100 plane, which was a full 100 inches. So thanks for your email, and if you have a question for Stumpy, email it to stumpynubs at runbox Dot com, and I'll give you my expert advice. That rabbit we cut earlier serves as a place to put our holes for our nuts that lock things down once our upper platform is in the position we want. That means we need a slot the same size as the bolt through our lower platform and that slot has to be aligned perfectly with the hardboard strip that runs on the dado in the center. A good way to do this is to just put it together and move that upper platform one little bit at a time using a Forstner bit to drill a series of holes from the furthest forward position to the furthest back position. Then use a chisel to clean the slot up. If you're doing several rests at once this can be a little tedious so there's another way to do it. Drill a hole at the furthest forward and the furthest back position. Then use a router to carefully cut out the waste in between until you have a nice straight slot. You might have to cut halfway through one side and then flip it to finish it up. I used to wonder why a lot of tool rests have a notch cut in the front so that the bed of the tool rest extends on either side of the grinding wheel. Well the reason for that is so that it can give extra support 
when a blade is sticking out further from the, the uh, grinding jig. I learned the hard way that it is not to support something you want to grind on the side of the wheel. When you finally glue it on the rocker disc, make sure it sticks out towards the grinder, giving you the most reach possible. And use a square in order to keep everything properly aligned. You don't want to mess it up at this stage in the build. I like my tool rest to be permanently mounted. I go to a lot of trouble to get things squared up properly and I don't want to have to mess that up when I move my tool rest from one grinder to another or I want to move the grinder from one bench to another. That's why I made three tool rests instead of just one. Some quarter inch mounting bolts do the trick but drill an oversized hole in the base of your grinding tool rest. That way you can shift it back and forth to get it just right before you tighten it down. You also want the jig to slide back and forth square to the wheel. Flipping it around backwards you can use the straight machined edge of the jig itself in order to square the tool rest. By mounting a separate rest to each grinding wheel and then everything to a board with the rubber feet from the grinder on the bottom it allows us to move things around while keeping everything aligned. The final and most important alignment is making sure that the grinding wheel itself is perfectly perpendicular to the tool rest. This will make up for any errors in cutting and glue up that you may have made. Check it with a square, use some washers to shim it, and make sure you get it as perfect as you can so that you get a good straight grind. What do you mean you're getting a shop dog? So you bring some stray dog, or even worse, a cat, into the shop because you felt sorry for it out there shivering in the snow bank with snot frozen to its nose. As soon as it thaws out, it starts eating everything in sight. You can hardly take a step in the workshop without slipping in some poop, and it's already developed a taste for mahogany that's cost you several board feet. Next thing you know, it's leaving a new litter of youngins in every corner, and you're spending half your shop time listening for a squeal every time you turn on a machine because some puppy's been caught in the belt. So here's what you do. Get yourself a shop chicken. These things are great. They don't bark at visitors. They eat their own droppings. And the only thing they're going to leave under your table saw is breakfast. Then we can sit back, have a cold one, because you've earned it, my friend.